Who's also here as a collaborator for our various projects, it could be structural specialization in South India. And uh, let's see, there's somebody else I was going to introduce, Cayman Lake, Sierra Barcello, who again will get a fuller introduction tomorrow. David Jimburu, who's a historian, we're hoping to win him over to food history eventually, but he also has a lot of grassroots experience from working with uh, the fishing sector. In Africa. And uh, is there anyone else I missed out who has just joined? Timo will be introduced in the round table. Um, online, there's nobody who's new there. Okay, so we are good to go. I also want to make clear that this is not just a random selection of people. Some of the connections are clear as in NYU and Minnesota, but what it is also about that these are some of the more informal collaborations we've been able to also to our uh, collaborative specialization food studies and in the case of somebody not speaking at the round table but later which is the international visiting graduate student specialization so yes some of the alumni of our fsc 1000 and fsc 2000 classes i know who i missed andrea had introduced herself she's also somebody who's part of this group not just through her work with nonprofits, but also as alumni so this is a shameless Kind of plug also for our food studies program. <laughs> so I'm wearing my hat for as a culinary professor now that we, we recently did make sense. Okay, so we have, uh, we have, uh, okay, you want me to put you later because we have Kelsey Kilgore. Oh, okay, yes, sir. Doing actually, this is a demonstration of what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I'm actually just going to get all right. Oh, more water. Yeah. Oh, more water into the tea dispenser. The hot water dispenser. Thank you. Okay, so case in point. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name, I will reintroduce myself. Kelsey Kilgore, administrator, and in another life, uh, I was also a cook. Uh, do you have a little thing about it? Yeah, yes. it doesn't work just. All right, I'm going to give it a whirl. This is one of my favorite tools of all time. So, uh, I am, though I'm now the administrator, I actually got my start at Culinaria as a teaching assistant, coming from um, a background in history uh, downtown. So, sort of randomly assigned here, but uh, turned out to be an excellent intellectual home and a really great application of the things I had learned over. The years uh, I had spent in kitchens and here, uh, here in Toronto and in Ottawa. So part of what I've been working on, or what we've been working on collectively uh, as a part of the pedagogical models at that uh, culinaria has to do with the application of some of the methodologies of practitioners to the, the work of food studies, to the work of working with food, teaching food, teaching with food, and what that means in, you know, in terms of us as Theoreticians uh, and as practitioners, so both in this space and then as a branch of the community. So <laughs> I have included here a picture of myself as a, a fairly stunned looking <laughs> young cook way back when. Um, but one of the things that I have found really useful in my own work as a teaching assistant, as someone who does food studies, is incorporating some of the just the, the practical steps that you learn in the kitchen. And it's an interesting thing where we talk about kitchens, we do work in kitchens, uh, and yet there is a way of thinking about food, thinking about equipment, and thinking about recipes that comes very much from this experience. And this is part of what I've been trying to build into uh, not only my own pedagogical method, not only my own teaching, but then in some training models for successive generations or successive cohorts of TAs. Um, one of the really interesting uh, 
parts about how culinary as a center operates is that we get a lot of our teaching assistants uh, from other departments. And so they're not necessarily coming to us as food study scholars, as food study students. And so part of you know, the, the joyful work that I get to do now, that I have the privilege to do here, uh, is in training practitioners, training uh, food studies teachers in how to use this space as effectively as possible. And so kind of thinking a little bit more like a cook. Um, insofar as the kitchen is a classroom, we have an abundance of material to think about. Like the kitchen as a space happens with or without intentional teaching, without intentionality in our pedagogy. More often than not, uh, you know, at the end of the at the end of the session, I'll say, okay, everyone, time to clean up. Especially during COVID, everyone had a task. They didn't have to do the dishes, but everyone had to spray and to wipe down their stations. And almost every single class before and during COVID and even after, you see these divides start to develop without anyone saying anything. I, I, it has become a part of the teaching itself to talk about how suddenly uh, uh, gender lines emerge in the kitchen, how the classroom becomes a demonstration of all these things you're talking about in the theory. So, I mean, I, I just see this as an immense opportunity and one that becomes even richer when we take very seriously the practitioner role, the kitchen as a, as a workspace, as a labor space, and incorporate that into our teaching. So, in developing some training for these upcoming cohorts or incoming cohorts, one of the things that I've been trying to develop is how to teach them uh, to, how to think about their recipes, thinking about thinking, thinking about how to read a recipe so that it's not just, you know, what can the recipe as a whole teach theoretically, but how can the various steps be used to teach? How can the way that you set up the room to do the recipe inform the thinking, inform the lesson. So, okay, you want to do uh, a recipe that involves writing. Okay, so suddenly the TA has to become a practitioner, has to come in early, pre-make a, a, a set for the first set of students to, to work on. So my dough is rising over here. My first students come in, they make the, the dough that's set to rise for the next group. And so having to think through it in these very staggered kind of, you know, uh, staggered workflow. Uh, and, and a big part of that comes down to things uh, like thinking about your recipe as mise en place. Thinking about, okay, if I give every student his or their own ingredients, how does that change what I can teach them with this versus them doing, as, uh, doing it as a group? So this is an immense opportunity and one that we've been working very hard to develop here at Culinaria. Um, partly just out of interest and, and growth, but also then of necessity because of the ways that COVID and the pandemic changed what we could do and how we had to do it. So I mentioned at the beginning that we had these big plexiglass barriers. So this fundamentally changed how I could teach, how my colleagues could teach. What we could do in this space was just radically different than what we had done in the past. Uh, so in the early, early days of being back on campus, so the will they, won't they, finally we were allowed, every single student had to have their own individual ingredients, their own equipment. I don't have 30 pieces of everything in this room, so how to, you know, having to rethink the entire recipe, the entire lesson based on the making of class became a way of rethinking the work that we're doing here. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity to work with my colleagues my fellow TAs and instructors in developing some of this advanced food pedagogy, uh, where we have been brainstorming some ways of working around the space, working with the space, and developing these, these sort of practitioner tools as a part of the pedagogy, very intentionally so. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, the pandemic. Please no, please see, ah, yes, my, uh, my beautiful plexiglass. Part of me laments the loss. It was a great splatter guard. Uh, so now we have traditional cleaning. One of the things that the pandemic forced us to do was to rethink pedagogy, right? So on the one hand, there's the in-kitchen component, um, but we also had to come up with ways of trying to engage students in their own kitchens, which turned out to be an incredibly challenging 
part of the, of the process, it's part, part of the, the pivot, as much as we all like that word. Um, because as soon as we started coming up with ways to try and translate this experience to that experience, to that space, uh, questions about ethics, equity, access, all became uh, fundamentally a part of the pedagogy, whether or not we meant for them to. It just became something that we had to talk through, deal with, uh, and, and work around in all of our models. So through uh, some, some experiential learning funding that we, that we worked with, we were able to play with a few different iterations of that, uh, including things like meal kits. This was actually a really, uh, really successful model where we produced these kits that had an historical recipe, sign up, et cetera, make it, and then it became a part of the discussion. But again, you know, you had for all the people that signed up, then lots of people didn't show up to actually take their, their food, which kind of blew my mind. People were feeding free food. But it was one of many models that we played with during this. Um, and the idea of segmenting spaces, once we did get back to the in-person model, trying to take everything we had learned, everything we had developed in the virtual model and bring it back into the kitchen, provided more opportunities, but likewise more challenges. So just very quickly, um, as I said, there are some things here that we did take from the pandemic that we're applying to adapting to our new models. Um, so the meal kits using uh, mapping projects, uh, especially in uh, FSCAO and FSCBO one, phenomenal work by Professor Jeffrey Culture and Joel Powell in, in visualizing the foodscapes here. That really makes a big difference for students and, and it translates between the virtual and the hands-on and in person. Things like filmed content, uh, the cooking shows. I'm not going to play it for you because it's horrendously embarrassing. <laughs> but, but there are, so above that um, is not just a blank screen. It is actually work that was done by one of our fellow TAs, uh, Janita Van Dyke, who in anthropology constructed a whole, or produced a whole set of cooking videos for her students as a part of the tutorial. Hers is done with the tools that we had. And then on the bottom, I got to, we, we got the media and communications people to jump in. So there's this really interesting dynamic uh, difference between the space itself and then what happens when we're able to incorporate more of the professional digital skills. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and so, you know, those are just examples of things we developed. And with those tools, we actually came up with a number of new ways to engage with the community, to engage with our partners, and these are models that we're now able to bring with us in the post-pandemic period. So there's a lot happening here. It's been a wild two years and it's been so phenomenal to be a part of it. And I wanna thank all my colleagues for helping make this happen, make this space happen despite the lockdown. Thank you very much. One of the ironies of this pandemic, of course, is many of us in the humanities and social sciences who basically worked with just uh, a laptop in the past have had to embrace different forms of technology. You saw me scurrying around like lost chicken for the voice after fire, but that's something again, a tool that we realize we are not using this for the last before, but for outdoor team trips and so on. But uh, part of it is also before the pandemic, I don't know what the situation is now. I used to try to do classes that students shared work, teamwork, and Google Drive and so on. But on this campus, as may be the case in many of your campuses, the challenge was very few students had laptops. And you know, there's a limit to what you can do on the time. And also, students on the other hand, they also didn't want them to be watching a movie on their phone or So there are tensions and difficulties there, but I think this kind of engagement that Kelsey and our wonderful team of here, Janita is now in Italy, otherwise she'd have been here. At this round round table. In fact, in December, we hope she present her work where she uh, did this fascinating project for the Italian World Food Store, which we did with some of the other things that we've been doing that our collaborators are doing. Okay, so now on to the next presentation, Stephanie Borkowski, NYU and shortly to be on July 1 to be your day or September 1, whatever it is, <laughs> the start date. And I will let Stephanie tell you where she's coming from because, in fact, we engaged with Stephanie and her then supervisor right at the start of the pandemic. Yes, thank you. I did take the opportunity to already put the Department of History and Culinary Research Center up there as my solution. So, <laughs> kind of it. Um, thank you, Joe. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie Wachowski, and I'm very excited 
to be talking a little bit about the food COVID-19 digital archive and collection, which I did with Professor Amy Bentley in the Department of Nutrition Thesis at New York University in 2020 and 2021. So in a press conference uh, on March 11, 2020, Mayor Bill Blasio reassured New Yorkers that coronavirus will not be transmitted by food and drink and said, and I quote, if you're not sick, you should continue going about your life. 95 cases have been confirmed in New York City to date. Five days later, there were over 2,000 cases a day, and the statewide emergency executive order was announced, which laid new ground rules for how we go about our daily lives for the coming weeks, months, and as we now know, years. And though we're no longer panic purchasing pandas or babysitting our sourdough starters, as we saw in those early days, these short lived trends really affected. Um, Left lasting impacts on our food chains and systems, and creating the Food COVID 19 archive, um, digital archive collections. Professor Amy Bentley and I sought to document these details, both to acknowledge the historical significance of the moment and to preserve it for future use and research. So, there are two main components to the website. Uh, the first is the archive, and second are the curated timelines and resources, which I'll get to a little later on. I'm going to start off with the archive. So it's made up of photos, personal reflections, student projects and essay submissions. The original hope was to get um, submissions from across the city to really capture the changing landscape for images and personal experiences. But any of you who have uh, tried to do this type of research you may know some of the challenges that come with asking for public participation. So um, we decided to do the timelines. In addition, Amy was going to be teaching a course on student communication in time of crisis. We just decided that all the student pro final projects would be about food and COVID in New York City and would go directly onto the archive um, to look at certain moments that we, we really want to hone in on. Um, over time, though, we did collect digital materials and photos from both the NYU community and NYC, and I want to show some of them now. So we got a lot about food provisioning on the far left. You can see the empty shelves that we might all remember in the center. Um, when we didn't know what six feet apart was, it was there were lots of interesting signs telling us how to do that. And on the right side, on the top, you can see a street food vendor um, who stopped selling stir-fried nuts and seeds and instead started selling hand sanitizer, masks, gloves. And then on the bottom right, there are a bunch of signs outside of the bodega, but specifically the fun one is that we have freshly school stock. Again, <laughs> it was a very hot commodity at the time. We also uh, saw a lot of changes in the restaurant industry. So at the very beginning, there were closed signs outside of tons of restaurants. Of course, these were temporary at the time. Later, we do see a lot of permanent closures. On the bottom left, you can see alcohol for sale. This is part of this uh, New York City program that allowed restaurants to sell alcohol for sale um, to go with their food, um, which was introduced quite early on to allow restaurants to make a bit of extra money. Um, and on the bottom right, you can see um, the Open Streets program, which is still in effect today, but of course that, that was like the first week they were given the green light very uh, quickly. And so it resulted in a lot of just like tables and chairs thrown out on the sidewalks, but people really came there very excited to go back out and uh, go to their restaurants. And then of course, at home, how we ate was very different um, for a lot of people. Um, on the far left, you can see people eating oysters at home. This is usually something that people would just eat out. Uh, in the center, one of my colleagues uh, was making his own masa for the first time, while everyone else was making sourdough. It was a very fun project. On the top right, you can see a school lunch program. Uh, one of our student projects looked at the expansion of the New York City school lunch program during COVID. And then the bottom right, just more canned goods, more shelf-stable goods that were all over. So the submissions were really fantastic, and I would love all of you to visit the website, which will be up there at the end um, later on. But we did know that relying on these submissions wouldn't be quite enough to complete all our research, so we decided to create our own timelines. So the research for the timelines was simple enough. It was time-consuming, though. It went from then going to search engines, looking at keywords, and then narrowing down by date. So first we look at a single day and then the week. And then after the fact, we go back and look at the whole month just to make sure that we were getting like these everyday headlines as well as seeing the whole picture of what floated it up at the end of the month. Um, then deciding how to organize the project was another learning process. Uh, we had so much information, again, going through search engines and getting literally every article that was coming in led to a lot, but we found that we could roughly uh, categorize them into these four areas, which were food shopping and provisioning, 
restaurants in the restaurant industry, eating at home, and food insecurity. Um, then, yes, the multiple timelines and the overflow. So why can we just make as much of the research available as possible with so that we have multiple timelines in each of these sections? Um, and then all of the overflow that didn't quite have a moment to like point to a date to would go onto that resources page. And just to show you what I'm talking about, I'm going to go through one full section, the restaurant section, so you can get a sense of what it is. So restaurants, you get to the landing page, don't have time to read this whole paragraph now, but basically there's like a bird's eye view of what was happening that whole year in the restaurant industry in New York City. Then you go down and see the first of two six month timelines, March 2020 to September 2020. And I'm just gonna point out a few of the highlights there. So from March 1st, but really this was happening from late January in New York City, Chinatown uh, restaurants and businesses started to suffer both in Manhattan and Queens. Um, partially due to xenophobia, partially a lot of other complicated issues. Then again, as I said at the beginning, we saw the uh, executive order come down in March 16th. We see outdoor dining um, begin in May 20th, very rapidly uh, expand. And then at the end of the summer, we start to see a really big push towards indoor dining, uh, mostly coming from the business owners who really want to get back to that. This led to a very rocky few months um, of trying to get indoor dining uh, going and consistent. So our second time was September to March 2021. Um, indoor dining resumes and the rocky road. You'll see a few points where it, it just backslides. Um, lots of restaurants were unable to pay rent, which led to the closures of many of them. Again, indoor dining was an issue. And of course, the COVID-19 vaccine and how this rollout affected restaurants, uh, restaurant workers, and restaurant patrons. So the timelines, uh, we use the software Storyline by Night Lab. Some of you might be familiar with this. And you guys have been talking about maps. They have great stuff for that. Um, and it is created and maintained by Northwestern University. Give them a shout out. They're great. Um, and they provide all these open source tools for uh, digital projects. And just to know, I'm presenting the information we did through graphs of COVID case numbers per day. It felt like a very natural choice at the time. We were all absorbed in maps and graphs, and especially when we were talking about the curve, flattening the curve, it was all over the news. And now looking back at it, it, it kind of captures my and Amy's anxieties around it too, um, as we were clearly absorbed by that as well. So, and then the last thing I wanna talk about is the resources page. Um, as I said, all the overflow from the timeline kind of went onto these back pages. They're definitely the fullest. Um, they are organized. Let's show. Yes, so a topic is presented at the top, and then chronologically, all of the sources come under it. They're all hyperlinked, and titles are written out, so it's super easy just to go to Control F on your computer and look for what you're finding. Um, find what you're looking for, excuse me. Um, through this page. So the first one, I'll just highlight a couple of them, is uh, chefs very early on when their restaurants were closing for indoor business, a lot of them redirected their efforts towards feeding um, certain communities. First, it was really healthcare workers. And then we saw that transition to more food, poor and food insecure people. And then through the summer, they were feeding a lot of uh, Black Lives Matter protesters, um, which we saw. Then another one that I wanna highlight, street vendors. If you've been to New York City, you know that New York City is nothing without well, all the street vendors. And this is one uh, topic that didn't really have like, a moment in time to put on the timelines, but we really wanted to highlight them in the resources page. So again, that's what all this overflow is. Um, in addition to losing business as brick and mortar restaurants did, they also had discrimination from police and they were notably excluded from federal assistance programs. So it was a really tough time for them through the past uh, two years ago and into now. Um, um, one more. Uh, the last thing I'll highlight is the mass closures of restaurants in New York City. Um, starting in May, a lot of restaurants just have to make that decision to close their doors. By July, we saw that 80% uh, of restaurants couldn't pay their rent anymore. And then by September, we were just getting weekly lists of restaurants um, that were no longer in New York City. So um, I'll stop there. I hope this wasn't too much of a bad trip back to 2020. <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing any questions later. So thank you.
on how amazing that we get some new insights like to you know remind people and we'll be talking about the Torah is that in the connections front that culinary and feeding could be received voices on the food front lines mm -hmm. all of what kinds of benki and by extension i hope Stephanie as well will be doing will be leading a workshop which will be open to everyone because it's going to be a public every workshop earlier we were worried how we do it now we're all will help us and you know so they get into documents on that tomorrow but i think this is something we can really bring forward because as i don't think i have to remind people what we understood with this PDG, the PDG grant in particular was knowledge sharing, but also knowledge dissemination. And I think you know, thank you, Stephanie, because I think from all the presentations today, and then you know, and very much now at the round table as well, what we are hearing is also the ways in which we not just share our knowledge, but also look to connect our knowledge and disseminate. Um, I'm also hoping as a byproduct that the graduate students here. And we have some wonderful new faces from friends and uh, on Zoom. Is that we maintain these connections? I know there's already a WhatsApp group connecting our visitors. So please feel ahead because one of the things I never forgot the pronunciation as to why you're telling me, you know what, you have to do it on your own. You have to network and meet people. People may, you know, everything may not work, but I think that's a really important <laughs> lesson for all of us. And since we have, Undergraduates here who are going into grad school soon, <laughs> some of them sooner, some of them later. You know, that's something I really want to say that objective of the round table, yes, it allows people to have a line on their CV and so on. But we really hope that you know there'll be conference panels, of tests, various effects at the different universities one things. And we would love to do it again next year. <laughs> Um, so next we have Julia Fine, and that is another success story because it is after Pilaria's plenary about what you know our feeding city project and about resiliency. <laughs> that Brian is also one of the presenters. You can go to this, I think, on the cusp of leaving us. That Julia Fine, who was then a medical student at Cambridge University, working in our own you know, plant history and <laughs> commodity food history, which and the Unlike Stephanie, we weren't able to you know form a course for her mind, I would say, more what I would call the egregious systemic barriers that universities impose to supervisors getting graduate students <laughs> of their choice. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that because I could talk forever, but that's one of the other reasons why I'm proud to say that there are many graduate students in this room who are not technically qualified, but us but we can work with us. And again. We would love to connect with our collaborators and partners of other universities. Okay, so on to Julia, who is, uh, as she mentioned in the introduction this morning, finishing up a well, uh, postdoc fellowship at Denver to know that she's actually starting her PhD now. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. So, like I said, my name is Julia, and right now I'm a Plant Humanities Fellow at Denver and Oaks, which is a museum. Um, owned by Harvard University, but in Washington, D.C., that focuses on many things that include Spartan and United States studies. Um, and so I work on a melon funded project, similar, uh, funded by the same people as uh, Tracy and Jesse's project on the plant humanities, and I'm an incoming PhD student in history at Stanford University. Um, and so today I want to talk a little bit about the work I've been doing with the plant humanities project, um, and then also some of the work within that I've done from our um, but I also kind of want to maybe stir reflection uh, and discussion on the role of humanities can play in these important discussions we're having about food systems and provisioning. Um, and the slides, uh, the images on the slides, I don't cite them, but they all come from uh, some research or digital humanities projects I've done. So feel free to email if you need any citations. Um, and next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Um, so before I want to talk about turmeric, I thought I would talk a little bit about the work we've been doing at Dunbar Notes. Um, Similar to what Stephanie was just talking about, I'm, it's a uh, open source project using Juncture, which is, it's not StoryMax, but it's a JSTOR run um, digital humanities tool. And we put together a lab that right now has 20 different narratives um, of different plants that kind of spotlights different plants. Mm -hmm. um, and we also, and that's kind of seemed to be uh, maybe a substitute for a textbook in different classrooms. Um, and then we also do public facing uh, pieces with JSTOR daily. So you can see one I just wrote on uh, Black Eyed Pea. Um, and the plant humanity that Dumbarton Oaks defines it, and I'm going to read it because I can never remember the wording, is an emerging interdisciplinary field which seeks to highlight the enduring significance of plants to human culture. 
In dialogue with science, advances the understanding of plant human relationships through the methods and perspectives of humanities scholarship to help address present human and environmental challenges in the Anthropocene. So basically what we're saying is we want to look at the way plants shape human culture and the way humans shape plants in turn. So kind of that dialogue. Um, and, and what we're really trying to highlight here is kind of what we call this fundamental paradox of plants. So we think of plants as quite literally rooted into the earth. But of course, they're incredibly mobile and have also catalyzed uh, voluntary and involuntary uh, migration of peoples. And I think, I mean, our lens really highlights that, like we're thinking about things like potato and tomato in South Asian cuisine. And so then you have to delve into kind of the longer histories of colonization and how those foods got there. Um, and so you, you can see some of the work we're doing there, but uh, I'm going to move on more to speaking specifically about turmeric. But my boss would be mad if I didn't plug the lab and say, please check it out if you Google plant humanity to will come up. Um, next slide, please. And so kind of speaking about the migration of plants, um, what I want to talk about today is really the history of turmeric within the British Empire. Um, so turmeric status as this really valuable plant has been really mythologized, um, including, I found it really interesting, the Oxford English Dictionary kind of gives an etymology of turmeric from the French for terra marite, or uh, extreme value from the earth. You all probably have better friends than I do. Um, it, that's probably not actually the etymology of turmeric, of course, but I think it really speaks to this idea of how valuable it is, how it's a merit of the earth. Um, and it, it was and remains critically important in South and Southeast Asia, where the plant is, uh, where the plant originated, and it's been in documented use there for at least 6,000 years, and that's just documented. So you see there um, uh, a kind of page from the Ikeva Veda, which uh, it, it has a hint on that page that reads, oh, color, do that color, this leper spot, and what is pale? Let the spot what is pale do that cause disappear. So it's this idea that turmeric is a, col a, a colorer um, that can help cure leprous spots. Um, and then there's also many other uses of turmeric in uh, South and Southeast Asia cultures, but I'm not going to really get into that right now. Um, so the I think I'm, right now I'm going to focus more on turmeric within the colonial temple. So the exact date of turmeric's arrival uh, in the West is unclear. Some scholars talk about it. Um, in certain uh, herbals from antiquity, but nevertheless, we know that before the medieval period, turmeric was not imported in mass to Europe. Um, but by the 17th century, as you can see from that cargo sheet uh, from the East India Company, which the Folger Shakespeare Library recently acquired, um, we can see how turmeric was imported in really large quantities from, I think this is from Bengal to um, Britain, and, when the, and then it was put up for auction and sold by the inch of a candle at the East India Company. Uh, Options and I promise I will get to the importance of this to the present day eventually. Um, so next slide, please. So in British colonization, like through through the project of empire, uh, both botanists as well as elite British households were getting access to turmeric for what might have been the first time. You see kind of an illustration from an herbal as well as a, a recipe for Indian pickle uh, from a 17th century early modern British cookbook that's held in the Folger uh, Shakespeare Library. Um, and even as it was incorporated into British diet, it continued to be regarded with both kind of a mix of curiosity and disgust. So John Keechee, who's um, a famous botanist, he has a 1694 herbal um, of physics and surgery, and he wrote that turmeric's color, in spite of its perceived similarity to saffron, um, was very strange to a European audience. He wrote that people of China make an ointment with this fruit, um, which men and women rubbed onto their bodies. Quote, this may seem very odd to those that are unaccustomed to it by reason of its color, and, and the color will become really important in a bit. Um, it also featured really heavily, again, in uh, British medicine, particularly in the, uh, for jaundice, and we can see kind of the idea of a homeopathy, light cures light, um, within kind of the humoral theories. Um, we also see within this early modern uh, recipe book, uh, the large, uh, it's from the Folger, again, the Folger has the largest collection of early modern English recipe books in the world, so it's a really great source, and all of the recipes are searchable online, which is fun. Um, and this is a recipe for Indian pickle written by a Miss Jones who called for a mixture of ginger, garlic, cauliflower, mustard, turmeric, and lemon pepper. Um, next slide, please. And, and so then the question becomes why? Why is turmeric featuring so heavily in early modern English recipes, especially when we can see from the herbals that it is regarded with this kind of mixture of curiosity and disgust? And I think one kind of answer, one idea um, you can see arises from this anonymous recipe you see on the left, which is for. Um, Promis and Capatas, which is kind of uh, given in an English recipe book, again held by the soldier, um, from, and it was written between 1690 and 1750. And Miss Wills, whoever that is, contributed this recipe to the book, which is kind of an adulteration of the Portuguese for chicken soup. 
Um, and it instructed, you can kind of make it out, it instructs the, the maker of this recipe to half color the rice with caramel. Um, and, and what I think is really interesting is that the instruction is not to flavor the rice, as we might think of in a recipe, but it's to color the rice. Um, and so what I kind of think we could argue is that the recipe is explicitly marked as foreign or different because of this kind of bright yellow color. And again, because of the Portuguese language title, which I've never seen at all in the uh, older cookbooks, except for this one, which might, you know, gesture for Portuguese colonization in the Indian Ocean. Um, and so the use of turmeric as a coloring agent might suggest the way British eaters could perhaps experience kind of the foreign from the context of their own home. Um, I think it's also really interesting, turmeric is a really important dish. Uh, is it really used in this pickled mango mango on the on the right? Um, so during uh, you know during the East India Company, uh, British colonizers became acquainted with mango because of limits of transportation and the fact that mango can really grow in Britain. They had no substitute for when they went back home to the metropole. And so what they would do is, as you see here, they would take melons and then rub them with turmeric. The melons were generally green melons and rub them with turmeric, and that was supposed to kind of simulate mango. Of course, it didn't taste like mango. Like, <laughs> a melon rub with turmeric is not mango. But, but I think what that shows is kind of the importance of this color. It was that turmeric yellow color uh, that becomes really important and kind of allows them uh, to continue the association um, with uh, kind of the East India Company and colors in Um Next slide, please. And so to wrap up, why does this matter? Why am I presenting this at a feeding city symposium um, that's mostly focused on the present day? Um, so Gitanjali Shahani in a recent book um, kind of argues about, describes the process through which, quote, food comes to be inscribed with racial character and in turn the racial other comes to be marked as edible. Um, and she talks about how spices like cardamom and nutmeg and mace, um, which kind of marked food as different flavor-wise, was a big part of that. Um, but what I kind of want to argue is that turmeric as uh, something that abuse it with color um, kind of allowed the same process. It kind of allowed this domestication of empire as some scholars have pointed to. Um, and you can see here some of the herbals in library collections are literally drawn on with color to, sim uh, to end uh, show how uh, bright the turmeric coloring was. And so to conclude, I kind of want to ask, well, what are the legacies of this obsession with turmeric's color today? Uh, and, you know, I think a lot of it still shapes public health uh, all over the world. So in a 2017 study of grocery stores in Boston, 100% of the samples of turmeric taken had contained lead chromate, which is a paint pigment that was used to make the ground turmeric so much brighter. Um, and what uh, these uh, this authors of the study um, interviewed a Bangladeshi turmeric trader who said, quote, Traders use this artificial color to hide the marks of pest attacks and other spots on raw turmeric. It is used during boiling and polishing to make the spice of crop brighter and attract big global buyers, including spice processing firms, who ship this turmeric all over the world. And so, of course, there are a lot of reasons why I'm not saying it all boils down to this reason, and there are many reasons uh, turmeric in Bangladesh continues to be sold with lead chromate. But I do want to think about kind of the ways. Uh, colonial legacies surrounding understandings of what food should look like or should taste like, continue to structure food systems even today, continue to impact health with the past. And that's my time. Thank you. I run off a strange coincidence. I think I told Julia this when you first, uh, you know, introduced yourself to culinary. Is Julia presented some of this research at Oxford Food Symposium remotely, I guess, in 2020. Mm -hmm. And I have been supposed to present a turmeric, but contemporary connected to our PDG project with indigenous small farmers in eastern and southern India, which of course I could not get to. <laughs> and I was too depressed to do that yet another remote conference with a time But yes, I think there are ways in which, you know, I think a lot of this work very scary historical work but also the imaginings of plants and color and i want to talk, I'll, I'll offer one maybe slightly navel gazing observation here when i was a graduate student in the uk and at cambridge deeply racialized place i washed my hands obsessively after cooking indian food don't like saying the mark of the oven and it is exquisitely ironic in many ways the turmeric that we to set up, turmeric stains of clothing, turmeric stains of hands, which is set aside also the mark of manual labor in the kitchen. 
has now found this new age miracle of food. <laughs> it is astonishing to me because turmeric, yes, is eaten as a vegetable in certain parts of South Asia, but I have actually never seen the fresh roots of turmeric. And now in my local Italian, <coughs> it's sort of stopping, right? And that thing is an exquisite irony. But one of the other things that I think that's the other side of your talking about, Julia, is that turmeric, actual fresh turmeric, unadulterated turmeric is getting increasingly unaffordable. So the story of Pinot and then mm -hmm. I'm not saying turmeric is not there, it's there. But part of turmeric is that you buy in an Indian, you know, or bazaar now is very likely to be about good. Mm -hmm. Fresh organic variety. Is this is all for this book. But now it's growing in Ontario, so you can buy it here now. Yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah, you can go to the market to buy it. But it's orange, not the other. Yes, yeah, so then maybe variety of turmeric. That's the other thing. And if I did that, gave us very important insight from family as well. So we could do an entire sub <laughs> project on turmeric. But it will also connect with the sustainable organic farmer the network we talk about tomorrow. So on to a site, uh, well, actually going back to some of the themes from the morning. But again, I think looking at how university learning has perhaps taken us beyond. And in very productive and fruitful ways. So we don't need another introduction. <laughs> Jesse and Miriam from the University of Minnesota. But that's that. the formal introduction. If you wish to do another introduction, <laughs> that is fine. Uh, well, before I was speaking to kind of the community partner for a university community collaboration, and now I'm going to speak a little bit as a graduate student and kind of um, how connect how you can connect to the community or like. Some questions that I also have for you all that I'd be excited to talk about after this. Um, please make connections in the next approximately 24 hours. Um, so I wanted to introduce the program that I'm in, Heritage Studies and Public History. And I think this segues off of your talk, Julia, a little bit with what does history have to do with growing food now? And Charles brought this up as well. Like, you can't really consider food justice or environmental justice without looking at the history of land use and place. Um, Heritage Studies and Public History is a relatively new program at the University of Minnesota. It's just been around, I think, five years. Um, they fund students for two years to kind of have intensive community partnerships. They pay the community partner to hire you as an intern, um, and they also just sort of foster this curiosity about sites of public history, museums, parks, memorials, high school curriculum, what have you. Wherever you encounter a narrative of public history, what are the myths told and other told stories there? And how can we diversify them a little differently? So this is an example of a project that we did this semester, um, working with a neighborhood organization um, to reclaim a, a street that was kind of destroyed for a highway public housing project in the 1930s. So we did some extensive mapping of what used to be there. You can see the um, top map on the left shows a 1924 map that's very densely packed with stores and businesses. Uh, it's a Jewish and Black neighborhood. Below it, you can see the paved over highway today. Um, it's much more sparsely populated. You cannot walk in and grocery stores like that. Uh, and this is just to say that like this kind of archival work and community organization work resulted in some I think like momentum for the movement, an activist organization was talking to the city about taking some of the city land that surround the highway and putting them in a community trust to uh, use how communities see fit so they become their own developers. And you know, that's a small step toward reclaiming some of the land use rights around something that has a lot of environmental impacts, right? Like, you know, the possibility of having some kind of like community gardening as well as more green space and trees, more production and things. So I see that relating to the small ID of this farm that we we're talking about before. It's in a different neighborhood in Minneapolis, but really similar trajectories of being um, sort of primarily an immigrant neighborhood in the early um, days in Minneapolis. Minneapolis wasn't really uh, didn't really become a city until uh, 1857 had its charter. Before that, it was um, more of a, there was a fort for fur trading uh, enforcement, and then slowly the logging industry. Um, and 
to sort of farming expansion brought most people to the city. So the Phillips neighborhood, you can see on the left is ringed by highways. On the right, you can see a red lining map from the 30s. Uh, and that shows kind of like the federal assessment of the neighborhood about the risk of lending any money there. So red is highest risk, blue is um, definitely declining. And then, yeah, and then blue is less risky. So there's just a long history of disinvestment in the neighborhood, which has resulted in kind of a cascading effect that um, has a relationship to what happens with growing food um, and food access. So there's a lot of, there's been arsenic in the soil and a lot of childhood lead poisoning has been a big issue in this neighborhood. Um, from, and the lead poisoning is from declining housing stock. There's absentee ownership, kind of with renters uh, and that results in ownership. Um, there's also an interesting project um, that you can find online, I won't open it here, but it's called uh, Climates of Inequality that tracks the kind of fight in this neighborhood to have an urban farm instead of a new water treatment plant, just because there's been a lot of heavy industry in the neighborhood. So small city successes is where it's at now because it was trying to become the urban farm at the street depot site that was the proposed treatment plant. And that's been so stalled by the city um, now saying that the community should raise $14 million to buy back the land in the city and then have their urban farm wherever $14 million should be. So um, yeah, there's some interesting research that's been done. So because that land wasn't available, we ended up with the small rented parcel that we're now. So I spoke a little bit earlier about like the location of the farm and slippery part there, um, the location of a lot of the protests and uprisings um, that go along Lake Street. And you can kind of see how some of those earlier maps map onto areas of like other kinds of And then this is more pictures from the farm and the greenhouse. And, um, you know, I think we've touched on a lot of this about the pandemic providing like an opportunity for regrouping and regrouping, deciding like, what's important to work on. Um, I kind of wanted to emphasize sort of the tricky nature of getting like city funding or some kind of grant funding for something that seems really promising like this greenhouse, but then it becomes like a pretty big burden for the community organizations to actually work on. And something that I'm interested in discussing with people here, it's like, what is like, what is the capacity? What is the potential for a small urban farming space? You know, like right now we have eight gardeners growing there. You know, could we be serving one? Like eight community gardeners aren't gonna be like revolutionizing the food system. Um, you know, it's very meaningful and it's just really just that it's kind of like what's in here. That, you know, having the time to put your hand in the soil and see something grow is really powerful for the people involved. And yes, others come through there with things like the team summer camp where we'll learn about harvesting and preserving food. And we've had the chance to move the transform to actually make connections to other community farms who are doing other kinds of things. So maybe. You know, we just have a place to start plants. And then this other group, you know, they're good at growing tomatoes, so they'll visit here. And then we also want to do like healing herbs, traditional medicines. You know, that could be at the neighboring Four Sisters farm. So finding a way to kind of specialize, because there are so many little gardens in this neighborhood, there's a capacity for that. Um, and then does the greenhouse end up being, you know, just a warm place to see some lettuce growing in winter or trying to That's, you know, kind of a tension that we're facing now that um, our crew thing of what to do with what we have and like whether to kind of use our limited capacity to seek more funding, have more space or to just really, you know, kind of question this nonprofit structure that we're into just to continue to um, with limited capacity. But right now it seems like the most promising use of the space is under the CMB audience space and a way to connect different groups. You can see like we've done middle school bike rides, um, because we still have a lot of like bike repair equipment from the bike shop. So still facilitating those kinds of things. We have a partner greenhouse in North Minneapolis that's farther along than us because they have paid staff. Um, but they're trialing out some ways that we might have uh, a neighboring gardener trial a 
make the edges thicker, which would be kind of a lower state way to see how it works. Um, and then, like, the alternative would be to sort of invest heavily in hiring a car manager to sort of experiment with a season of doing higher production to actually see more season of the Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have a instead of coffee. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. housekeeping announcement since we'll be leaving roughly. Uh, uh, no, no, this is more for other people. <laughs> if uh, people you know want like a bit more coffee, water, whatever. But uh, these cups are you also take home, but we ask that to bring them back to tomorrow. If you're not coming back tomorrow, please take them home. Or you can leave them here and they'll get washed to <laughs> the professional dishwasher and you can use them. But yeah, just so that we have more cups and we are sure that people will like them, but how's people going to ask it? <laughs> okay, I'm starting to call you. Can share the presentation? Exactly. Yes, so yes. Thank you, Marina. That's a very important one. I hope everyone knows in this room that it's being recorded. And uh, so that is actually part of you know most things that happen at Killer. And this is long before Zoom. But the idea was that this is a knowledge sharing block. And there are a number of people in different time zones and who for various reasons are not even maybe in the Zoom, some are in the Zoom. But the idea is that it will be shared with the PPG share stakeholders in the internal SharePoint. But you know, unless we hear like from somebody. You know, that they have to be object. Ultimate, I think it would be great if we could make it out of part of our public knowledge dissemination as well. So, yes, so if you have any objections, anyone, let us know. But certainly, a part of, a part of the PDQ's mission, we have undertaken to have things internally shared on the SharePoint. And if you are yeah, not part of that network and like a grand round table, let us know if you have any objections, but we would love to share this because think of it. Go to Julia, go my former, and South India to actually look at your section. And since I'm not going to talk about other languages, but since Neo has you know, undertaken to translate the outcomes from this workshop, I think, you know, again, on the outside of knowledge dissemination, this is a great point. And I can think that definitely what you shared from and your would be so inspiring. You know, for audiences to be reading it in Spanish. Okay, so back to our. So we're going to be changing on. Uh, okay, so we have the go. Go the go again. And then so Joan has already introduced himself, and then we have Yesil, and after that we will do a slight change of form to short video presentation. Um, Okay, great. So you are on. Can I'm on. Okay, so uh, I've met, I think, most of you, some of you virtually, some of you I've worked with for a few years virtually. Uh, but I'm Joel. Uh, I am a, a history graduate student here at U of T. My own research is focused on food science uh, and sort of food science at the intersection of industrial transformation and cuisine, and how food scientists are really involved in thinking about cuisine, who they lean on. But I'm not going to talk about that. What I'm going to talk about instead is uh, some work that I did with uh, Professor Pilcher on a previous shirt grant that somewhat preceded uh, the work that's been happening at PDC. So it's more of a uh, historical project. Um, yeah, I'll need you to change this. Thanks. Um, well, one second here, Joel. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, no problem. Go ahead. Uh, so the project is called. Um, Tasting the Global City. Uh, and it was a five year long uh, shirk project. Sorry. Okay. It's, it's not a very exciting slide. So here we are, Tasting the Global City. Um, so, this is a project also hosted here at UTSC. Uh, and basically, the questions that we were trying to ask within that project were you know, what are the histories of Toronto's food? Like, how did Toronto become sort of this global city? 
you know, somewhat well known for being a large multicultural hub, bringing all kinds of foods together. You know, Scarborough is the largest catchment area for newcomers in Canada. So it really is this diverse place, but you know, is that really the history of Toronto as we know it? And how did that happen? Uh, in some ways, the bounds of that project were, were above our capacity to answer. Uh, but some of the things we were able to do uh, at the very least were to engage with some of the Canadian historiography, which was actually you know, somewhat limited in Toronto. Uh, we were able to engage with food studies methods uh, and also mobility studies to, to bring these things into conversation. Uh, and so I'll just talk briefly about two of the methods that we use uh, within this project uh, and maybe how they bear on uh, some of the work that Feeding City uh, is doing. Uh, so one of our first focuses was on the archives. Um, I am trained, being trained as a historian, Jeffrey is a historian. Uh, and so we really decided to put one of our, our main focuses on doing some of the archival work to uncover uh, you know, aspects of Toronto that are not terribly well known. Uh, and one of the things that we found out, uh, even just doing our, um, you know, our historiography about Toronto uh, and, and getting into the literature is that, you know, Toronto looms large in Canadian history, but it does not have a strong historiography of its own. It is not really well studied the way that, you know, you think of urban histories in Montreal or in Vancouver or even Winnipeg. Uh, it's just sort of, um, you know, sort of taken for granted in some ways. Uh, and one of the things we wanted to confront was this idea that, you know, Toronto is this Anglo-Irish outpost. And of course, in many ways it, it is and really was, at least until the 1980s, with changes in Canadian migration policies. Um, and, you know, we, we can see it today in our grocery industry, right? Like, uh, Wawa's and the Weston family started as a small bakery in downtown Toronto, became one of the uh, large purveyors of the British Empire selling biscuits from Toronto, shipping them overseas to England, which is somewhat surprising. Of course, meatpacking Toronto was a major center of that. But we were also focused on, you know, both that and the infrastructure built, but also, you know, the uh, food histories uh, that were much more on the margins. So, you know, people that are engaging in foods uh, as peddlers of foods, as small cart purveyors, uh, people that were engaging in clandestine meatpacking and animal raising throughout the city, uh, and gardeners, and the contributions that the, these people were making uh, to the food system. Uh, and this, uh, as uh, Professor Milgram raised earlier, uh, really draws on Jeffrey's concept of culinary infrastructure. Uh, this idea that, uh, if I might paraphrase in my own term, sorry, Jeffrey, <laughs> is sort of, uh, you know, thinking about the relationship between the structure of the food system and taste and food. Uh, and thinking about that dynamically, not just as how infrastructure shapes, you know, the kind of taste that we have in our, in our culinary uh, pathways, but also how our, you know, striving to uh, maintain familiar tastes, and maintain our cuisine, also can put pressure and shape infrastructure. Uh, and we are interested in how migrants in particular, uh, especially migrants from outside the main areas, from outside you know, Ireland, Scotland, and England, and uh, later on, you know, Italy. But, you know, thinking about how migrants coming in rather small numbers were actually having an outsized impact on the food system. And so this took us into archives at the University of Toronto to some extent, uh, the Toronto Municipal Archives, uh, at the Ontario Archives, and some small community archives. Uh, I'll just say Toronto also at U of T has a somewhat forgotten uh, but important place within Canadian historiography as a pioneer of multicultural research in the 1970s under the work of Robert F. Hardy. So we're able to dovetail a little bit on some of the work that had been done with ethnic communities uh, kept at hand. Uh, and so one example that we found uh, as an important example uh, you know, of sort of this alternative provisioning in Toronto is Kensington Market. Uh, Kensington has been around since uh, the late 19th century. Um, it was sort of, uh, it became a place that a lot of people moved to particularly the Jewish community in Toronto moved to, uh, it still exists. It's, it's uh, at the intersection of uh, Spadina and College and runs down to basically uh, more or less Bathurst and Dundas, so that sort of area. Uh, if you're in Toronto long enough, uh, you'll probably get a chance to, to visit it, I'd recommend. Um, and you know, Kensington has long been understood as an ethnic bazaar. That was the language used by reporters, by the city, by uh, you know, people interested in, in engaging with Kensington academically. 
uh, and really was a home for Toronto's Jewish, Italian, Portuguese, and later Chinese, and even later uh, the Muslim business community. Uh, one of their sort of most notable aspects was the retail politics of Kensington. Um, Kensington was a, uh, a place where you could find live animals uh, for sale, live rabbits, live fish. Uh, there was a whole slaughtering industry that took place. Uh, and of course, this became a problem for uh, city officials. Uh, it became a problem in two different ways. In one way, there was a, uh, a problem with having live animals just throughout the city in general. In the 1970s, there was uh, an attempt to wrangle all of the city's wild dogs, dogs, people's domestic dogs were running free. And that actually led to a major clampdown on animals in general. And Kensington business owners were actually uh, the recipients of quite a lot of surveillance. Uh, and uh, you know, people that were raising birds for generations and slaughtering them in small areas, often in religious, uh, religious ways, were um, you know, targets of the system. So urban renewal and these laws started to take place. Um, and uh, eventually by the 1980s, Kensington was sort of transformed and, and changed. And uh, you know, without its animal politics, became more of a restaurant area and it's been transformed in other ways. So that's sort of the retail side. But of course, we're interested in thinking about the infrastructure that supported that retail economy. Uh, and so this led us eventually to look at uh, the broader infrastructure of wholesale in Toronto. Uh, I know Sarah's here. You've done quite a bit of work thinking about the Ontario food terminal. Uh, in our archival research, we were able to think about the predecessor to the Ontario food terminal. And actually, in the case of Kensington Market, and, and in the case with a number of uh, you know, fruit and vegetable purveyors throughout the city, uh, a lot of their food was actually coming from and being routed through a ramshackle uh, railway uh, depot down at the bottom of Young Street, right on the wharf. Uh, it was built in the 1850s uh, and survived, uh, you know, by virtue of the fact that a lot of uh, immigrants, uh, business owners came in and, and wound up taking over the space and running a wholesale food market. So most of Niagara produce actually came through this broken rail terminal and was exchanged in, in a lot of ways that was uh, actually relatively efficient, uh, even if it was somewhat informal. Uh, and so for feeding the city, this gives us a sense of the culinary infrastructure in action. You can think about as Scarborough builds out, you can think about the, the kinds of infrastructure that continue to support um, you know, the, the retail economies that we're, we're investigating. Um, and I'll quickly get through digital mapping. This was the other side that took up a great deal of our, our time and energy. Um, so inspired by some work that was done in New York by your daily banks, uh, mapping sort of the food system, uh, we undertook to uh, map digitally Toronto's food system, including all its retailers, wholesalers, purveyors, producers of food uh, dating to the 1860s. Uh, we had a chance to find maps from the 1790s that gave us a sense of of Toronto, but the streets were just so different, it was really hard to, to really build that out. Um, uh, and building on business directories and community directories, we have managed to create a series of, of maps that really sort of show, uh, you know, what, what the food system looked like at any given period of time. And one thing I'll just say is, um, we were fortunate to start a map on 2020, we began it in 2019, um, and completed it really just as the pandemic was hitting. So we actually have a snapshot of Toronto's food system at the very beginning of the pandemic. And it's interesting to look at that, and it's actually quite hard to look at it because it is so massive. It's the entire GTA, it will break your computer or web browser if you're trying to open it without certain precautions. But it gives you a sense of what the city looked like. And it, it, it is interesting to compare now uh, and to think about you know, which communities are different. So very fortunate to have uh, been able to, to do that kind of work. Uh, and that mapping has since played into um, uh, you know, figuring out how to support uh, small businesses right now in Starbucks. So using the skills that we learned, uh, we've been able to use data sets that we're comfortable with uh, to isolate and narrow down small businesses uh, that uh, we've been able to work with. It's very difficult to tackle these things, but we found that mapping and data set and database building uh, makes it a lot easier uh, to sort of filter through. Um, so that's probably the other practical way that, that this project has helped feed us. Uh, I can actually very quickly give a practical way of going to start. The skills can inform policy making. Uh, 
that when you know we started talking to the city of Toronto, we discovered that they had gone to a different set of computers for a project that you know was going to be this problem with restaurants. There was actually was no foreseeable like method. So I went through that list and I looked for so it was supposed to be about supporting diverse by pop restaurants and so on. I went through that list and as far as I can make out, it was a I don't know what methodology they use, but we were able to go to do <laughs> and you know call on that set of skills that we use, and that is from where the list of those 200 culturally diverse restaurants the across six cover awards, which is our phase one, have been provided. And so if you had more time, it would be with the <laughs> food ordering and the last minute based on who we love to deliver, is that you know we could have actually provided you a similar thing in each of the restaurants we view, Bao Mama, Chakazar. You know, how sorry, so that is part of our issue. And certainly with the city, we feel that we have been a good people, but you know, at the start of our study, we have to kind of educate them why we needed to do research ethics, so we don't talk to anyone. Why from just randomly send you know students out? Why well at that point we won't even allow to go out in person, but also whether both the mix of ethnocultural skills and actually research background. So as we talked about in the morning, you know, that is where. The ivory tower needs to kind of talk at the same time with itself and translate what we are doing into common parlance to actually be effective. Okay, next presentation is another graduate of one of our two studies, a graduate classes enabled by Zoom at the start, Imo Yassin, who also is brings us the very rare multilingual skills of being able to draw. Not just on his expertise in Turkish, since he comes from Bayer but also our uh, several years of stay and immersion and work in China. <laughs> and so that is what informs this project, which was part of his crosswalk for our graduate course. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, Central Asian food waste at the restaurants in Toronto. And before that, briefly, uh, uh, introduce myself. My name is Emma Ishii. I'm an international graduate student uh, at York University. I'm about to complete my first year of my, my master's program, and then soon I will start writing my thesis. Uh, my, my research project intends to present a critical approach to the prevalent psychotomic context, which is more or which is more or less based on the idea that the normal can set into cultures uh, and share an antagonistic form of existence. However, I believe that the mutual dependence and complementarity among nomadic and settled entities were as significant as those differences that have generally been over the time. So my thesis is interdisciplinary, and I want to specifically focus on the interaction between the settled and nomadic society in Asia under the context of food culture and especially food names. Uh, my research intends to examine a small yet essential part of the culinary heritage of Turkey peoples in Eurasia. Uh, today's presentation is also about my master thesis, but uh, I'm actually discovering uh, the Central Asian restaurants in a city uh, which I'm not very familiar with. So I just came here six months ago. So when I was doing this uh, little research, I didn't know the city. So I learned the city, I found this uh, little family run Uyghur Uzbek restaurants, but uh, the final project, this final project was conducted by using some of the ethnographic research methods in the context of the research ethic called the law. And actually I followed the history of Central Asian peoples who might be regarded as the descendants of pastoral nomads of Asia and changed their story to the multi-ethnic food base of Toronto, where I found them as immigrants running the restaurants or working in one of them. For this assignment, I visited five restaurants, examined the preparation and presentation of some staple dish traveled from China to Central Asia, and presented my results geographically, imitating a road from east to west, from Midwest China to Central Asia. So the first restaurant is Homemade Ramen Noodle Shop, is located in Chinatown, Toronto. Uh, geographically represents an appropriate starting point for the Culinary journey towards the Western Asian modern China. I visited this restaurant uh, on April, and 
what they are selling this twenty-one year old onion. The traditional beef noodles, their signature dish, uh, and the lenjo, the city, uh, is, is the, like is famous for the most authentic noodles, most authentic noodles in China. So it is interesting that in many Chinese restaurants, uh, for example, the name of the restaurant telling something different to the Chinese people and something other to non-Chinese people. For example, it says simply Zhongguo, Lanzhou, Miro, Lanyan. So they are telling that we are selling a specific kind of uh, noodles. But it's telling to the non-Chinese people that, you know, it's just from one of these So it's many also like that. So uh, I like this uh, uh, contrast. So the second place, Medical Taste of China, I was introduced uh, by Professor Sharma. I like here. And now we are going to turn west and like we are coming to Xinjiang, Uyghur region of China. And the food are, food are changing, but we are still in Chinatown. So the clientele, the main clientele is the Mandarin company speaking people of China, but they are enjoying the Western Chinese food. So uh, this place is quite authentic, but I can say it is a bit fusion in the middle of uh, modern Chinese and Uyghur food. Uh, so I don't have much time, so I'm going at this best as I don't manage uh, So now we are in uh, this place in Scarborough, like near to here, but far from the city center. And here, uh, in the case of this, this uh, Flora and Good Cuisine, the meaning of Chinese and English names are the same. This, they refer to an ancient oasis kingdom within historical Eastern Turkestan. Mm -hmm. However, the history of Koran is no land, actually, when you refer to it, predates the history of Turkic peoples in this part of the city. And people previously living here are thought to be Indo Iranian or in, in the European origin. In fact, it is not often to see an Uyghur restaurant named by a pre Turkic Islamic name. It's interesting. So uh, I'm a bit uh, like. One of my research is about the mouth of one part of my research is onomastics. So I, I like the names, what they are telling us. So I'm a bit uh, obsessive about that, but still. Uh, just like the restaurant decoration and table settings, the menu is the menu here is unadorned. And as the Uyghur lady we met have informed us when we arrived there, they only cook a couple of dishes on a daily basis, so everything. Can be served with it's a family owned uh, typical Uyghur restaurant, and uh, actually, they're cooking very delicious food. And the summit our kebab house is also this is located in Mississauga. Our kebab house was the second restaurant I had been to that served authentic set related dishes in every aspect, such as preparation and the presentation of the food. Here, the language heard is Uyghur Turkic, and the workers in the restaurant are communicated in their native language. Uh, the Uyghur name of the restaurant is Samrida. Actually, it's Samrida in Turkish, and it's now in Uyghur Turkic. It's God's mouth and Kian Shan in Chinese. So, uh, this is a very common name, common restaurant name in China, in, in uh, Uyghur, in Xinjiang, the Uyghur part of China. In Samrida Kebab House, there was no confusion about the restaurant's identity, and the ethnical emphasis was prominent. The language used among the workers, the presentation of the food, and the table etiquette were all faithful to the Uyghur setting in a restaurant. Although there were no misunderstandings between us, my conversation in the Uyghur language with the owner of the restaurant were still not as fluent as I would like to. However, uh, the fluency of the cook who worked in Ankara, my own town in Turkey, was so impressive that the conversation turned to not only to be immediately upon his joining our chat with the owner. Our conversation was mostly about food, their business, and my studies. Initially, it was not political at all. However, our chat inevitably included some unpleasant parts where they had to mention the heartbreaking situation in the Uyghur autonomous region in China. After a question in English coming from a Chinese speaker, <coughs> the language we were conversing to each other, the conversation turned into Chinese community. And thanks to our chat with the young Chinese man, I also realized that. The Chinese clientele is essential part of their business. Uh, so, yeah, and that's the restaurant, similar to old restaurant, it's in North York. It's a big, tragic, restaurant, restaurant. 
Yeah, and I visited there many times. I like it. Uh, the sweet dishes were very famous in the Soviet culinary realm. Thus, not surprisingly, the main philanthropy here was a group of people coming from different post Soviet countries. So, uh, the, the, the environment is completely changing, although the foods are similar. Now you hear, uh, you, you, you hear people speak in Russian and uh, they all look familiar with the Uzbek set of tables and Central Asian dishes. Uzbeks are descendants of Tamerlane, speaking a Turkic language very close to Uyghur, and they are blessed in terms of their culinary cultures, indicating that since they enhanced the, the ancient food ways of Sogdiana and Bakhtia. So, my final remarks uh, all in all, Central Asian restaurants are scattered all over Toronto, and their customer profile reflects the dramatic history of the country that can be defined as the heirs of the Central Asian cultural heritage, culinary heritage. Uh, Chinese expansionism and Soviet colonialism over the region seem to lead to discovery, seem to lead to the discovery of Central Asian foodstuffs by the Russian-speaking peoples of this continental East. Similarly, although the adverse effects and bitter memories of the political oppression targeting the Uyghur minority are strongly felt in the air of mostly family-owned restaurants they run, the necessity of building constructive and friendly relations with the loyal and proud of Chinese customers discourages them from speaking up openly. Besides, one of the nominal mottos of capitalism, the customer is always right, and the oriented way of thinking about <laughs> the trip, their guests from the guard thus cannot be disturbed during their visits. Such shortcut solutions seem to help them to leave bad feelings behind and stay focused on their future in Toronto. Like many other ethnic minorities did before, people from Central Asia are also trying to find a fertile place to root and flourish in Canada. Nevertheless, in the restaurants where there is a Central Asian place are served, there is a lot to talk about with the owners, workers, and customers. Also, there are many untold stories from the endless steps of Inner Asia, and just at the table might be the only place leading to unlock the doors locked inside. The food served there might be the only key to the lips seen through bitter experiences. My humble restaurant outreach enabled me to make critical observation on these sites. However, in terms of numerous aspects, more research focusing on the Central Asian food waste and the culinary culture is needed and worthy of academic interest. Thank you so much for listening to me. Now we actually shift back uh, in a way to renderings from the, the, the spirit of the community. And I'm very happy to say that uh, past and present <laughs> PhD students from different departments. So we are going to start with uh, Shivan Bonasteel, who we've already been introduced to in the morning. And uh, she's going to play a one minute clip. <laughs> Two minute clip from her wonderful uh, video film of her experiences running food, uh, working as a food uh, advocate. But uh, I just want to say that after that, we're going to have, um, we'll see what the time permits, but there is uh, another film which comes to us from somebody who is now graduated, is that we're not here. Uh, a UT student who I think never actually managed to get here, did a master's in the music department that works as a grassroots food advocate in the COVID. So we're going to end with Adelaide's film, which is in Spanish and English. And the first switch, Siobhan, and Siobhan, do you want to do an introduction or the video today? Okay. Yeah. Just play? Yeah, just play. All right. Seventy five hundred pounds every year, mostly white meat, so the gals and sharp eyes. The Cambridge Food Bank serves a population of over one hundred and forty five thousand people in the city of Cambridge and the township of North Dumfries. 
and together along the Blue Bank of Waterloo, served the entire region of Waterloo, which is made up of eight municipalities. We got there. Onions. <laughs> <laughs> Pull from the ground. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Local food and sustainable food systems as a vehicle or agent of ecological and social transformation embodies an intersecting space of environmental justice, social justice, healthcare, and food systems. This is made clear from all the ways that local food is a benefit, from increased mental, physical, and emotional health, to benefits to the environment, increases in social capital, and community food security, especially for marginalized people. In my work in the community of Cambridge, developing food programs and leading and co-leading groups to grow more than 30,000 pounds of local food for donation to the local food bank, all of these benefits were observable to me. Community food growing spaces benefit people on all levels, with the most notable to me being that gardens are a space to celebrate diversity of participants, a place where everyone belongs. I've really been obsessed since 2014 with this notion that we could create a movement that could bring people in need through sustainable localized food systems. In my years of working across a number of organizations and gardens, my interest has always been to go <coughs> and prove that we could do it. Not only can we do it, we are doing it. The work itself has now grown into Plant That Seed, a nonprofit founded in 2020. The truth is, the story is not over. We're really just getting started. The demand that see, watch it grow. Plant that see, and watch it grow. Plant that see, and watch it grow. And I have told by the sea, the silver plant that see, and watch it grow. Drinking water before bed burns 46 pounds <laughs> in two months. That we will also make available. And I mean, I will tell you, my grand project is not just for me now as to translate some of these outputs into Spanish, but because we have wonderful uh, students working with us who kept the grant we have paid, and we have capacity at least for Arabic right now, and hopefully Mandarin. And so that is, I think, you know, part of the outreach that's really, really fun. And one of the examples comes from Abigail's film, what we're going to show. And Abigail, by the way, is an ethnomusical student who's taking advantage of, you know, took the food studies uh, specialization and took up courses in food. And one of the things I learned, and in fact, the Feeding City website is there's a wonderful blog post she wrote documentation. In fact, I believe we have a photograph on our uh, bush of Euclid as well from Yamaha. And one of the things she had talked about in class was about the, how they heard from the urban migrants come to the food bank, but how important it was to go through the sense of belonging, of citizenship of people. And of course, we have the scholarship, you know, from um, scholars in Toronto in North America. But that really struck us to very rare set of voices. So she made a film, which is about urban place thinking, which again we make available, which is 32. Uh, minutes long, but having you know, partnered with organizations like Tom Urban God and so on, we felt that it was important to have the voices, the community testimonies themselves. So what you're going to watch is part of that 15 minute video, which has the direct voices in Spanish with English captions of uh, uh, those community gardeners who bank recipients who talk about they have to migrate from the countryside to the city. And so in many ways, I think it speaks to the heart of what our PBG project is about. Thank you. Yo me quería ya pues en mi tierra y cómo le puedo decir mi infancia no era tan buena. O sea, sabe que la, las personas del campo siempre somos como somos somos como más abandonados, o sea, de la sociedad porque el hecho que estamos en el campo casi pocos nos toman en cuenta en el sentido, o sea, cómo le puedo decir más que solamente nuestros padres 
afirmamos y ahí del resto nadie más. O sea, entonces yo, yo crecí, como le digo, con, con, también con necesidades, porque ese tiempo, como le digo, en el campo, si uno no se siembra, ya mira cómo hacemos acá en el huerto, es la misma costumbre, esa como si la vida del campo. O sea, se siembra, se espera que crezca, produzca y, y bueno, recoger los frutos, todo lo que uno se siembre, ¿no? Yeah. 
Stop and get to a discussion. Sorry, we don't have time to take the whole thing, but we should get to the discussion now and then to the next. Yeah. All this will be a great day.